Hey guys, it's Pat and Kessering, and welcome back. Yes, it's been a long time, but seeing as I'm a couple of days from graduation, uh, I figured it was probably time to start doing some videos again. And hopefully, uh, at least for a couple months, I can uh, focus on them, not exclusively, but focus on making some videos. Uh, and hopefully, in theory, if everything goes according to plan, I will be able to build up a big enough backlog to hopefully see through uh, at least the first semester of uh, uh, graduate school. Don't know, but we'll find out. Anywho, uh, let's get into this one. Uh, this is a video that is I wrote a long time ago, so, and I haven't rewritten, so eh, this could be interesting, but I hope you guys enjoy anyway, and uh, yeah, um, look forward to slightly more regular uploads still not very regular but slightly more regular uploads um so i am alive i'm not dead uh somehow so i'm back uh and let's just get into this star trek fans tend to disagree on a lot of things was cisco right in attacking the maquis does discovery fit into canon although that one might have been answered yeah that, that'll be another video is the jj verse Good. Again, that'll probably be a subject for another video. There's one thing that tends to be universally agreed on uh, in the Star Trek fandom, though, and that is that Star Trek Voyager is the weakest link of the Star Trek series. And unfortunately, this is an assessment that I have to agree with, but not because the series doesn't have an interesting concept or excellent characters or even good stories. The problem, in my opinion, arises from, well, lazy writing. Now, there is a distinction between bad writing and lazy writing. Bad writing is, at its heart, a lack of care for the quality of the piece. A good example would be Pirates of the Caribbean 5, a movie written for the explicit purpose to cash in on the success of the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise. And as a result, the story is full of plot holes, the characters are wholly uninteresting or annoying or unlikable, uh, and the curse that is the main point of the movie comes off as a contrived plot device that doesn't actually make any coherent sense. To fix bad writing, in the case of the Pirates of the Caribbean movie, again, this will probably be its own separate video at some point, would require basically an entire rewrite of the story and the characters to bring them more in line with the previous movies, as well as a completely different curse to make both logical sense and fit the plot of the movie. And that's just the beginning. Again, that will probably be its own video at some point. Instead, the movie is a collection of outdated cliches, rehashed villains, and contrived deus ex machinas. Now, I don't want to spend uh, too much time on the problems with, with Dead Men Tell No Tales, which are numerous and aren't specifically linked to writers. That's a can of worms that I will have to, again, dedicate another video to. Actually, probably a completely separate video from how to fix it. Um, anyway, I don't want to spend too much time talking about that because that's not what Star Trek Voyager is, in my opinion. So... What about Star Trek Voyager? Did Voyager writers uh, care about the quality of the show? Uh, or did they write just to cash in on the name? I don't think it's the latter. Uh, and I know some people, specifically Steve Shrives and probably Lord Reloaded and a bunch of other Star Trek fans will disagree with me on that. But I don't think Voyager had bad writers. I think they just had lazy writers. Voyager often comes off as inconsistent disconnected uh, with both their own series and the greater Star Trek lore in general. Um, let's look at a couple of examples, uh, the first being from the uh, Equinox two-part episode uh, and the problem with Voyager's design. Now, one could argue that this planet was special in a way that Voyager couldn't fly into the atmosphere, um, and the Nova-class USS Equinox could, and that would be a valid argument. And I'm pretty sure they might have even said that in the episode, although it's been a while since I've watched the episode. Um... Anyway, uh, if Voyager was an exploration ship, roughly designed and built in the same time period as the Equinox, and it's twice the size, one would think it could handle similar or stronger atmospheric pressures or atmospheric or climatic conditions. The planet only serves as a way to get Voyager away from Equinox in order for Ransom's plan uh, of escape to work. Uh, but there could be any number of special events or anomalies that could keep Voyager away from Equinox. Um, however, they didn't give us any, which, I mean, it's fine. BSG did stuff like that all the time and didn't tell us why something happened. Uh, but BSG wasn't inconsistent in doing this, uh, nor was it inconsistent in, in uh, the stuff that it showed us. 
it made sense when Battlestar didn't tell us, uh, for instance, uh, how the Cylons were tracking the colonial ships, uh, tracking their jumps, because the Cylons are supposed to be the mysterious and menacing and sinister uh, alien robot race. And the colonials probably didn't know how they were tracking them. However, we've seen, and we'll see, uh, Voyager in planetary atmospheres, uh, and because a brief reason is given, it's likely the crew knows why they are limited here, so there's no point in leaving it ambiguous, because it being left ambiguous creates a plot hole. In Battlestar, it sets a tone and serves the story uh, by building up the threat of the Cylons, uh, as well as being a good piece of character development and world building, not to mention uh, it's the plot of the entire episode. In Voyager, it's a continuity error uh, from one scene that serves as plot convenience for the episode and plot armor for the Equinox, uh, and is in a scene that could be written differently to have Equinox escape Voyager some other way, have Ransom be portrayed as a irresponsible captain for putting a ship at risk. You know, it, come up with any any insert here, and you'll probably have a have a a more plausible explanation uh, for these two ships separating. Um, maybe even show Ransom as a better tactician than Janeway or something. Uh, to that effect, that serves as character development uh, and world building. Um, you know, make it something that is that the characters are proactively doing instead of reactively uh, doing because of the situation at hand. Another one, uh, in fact, one that Lore Reloaded brought up uh, in a video at one point, uh, is the episode with the Cardassian dreadnought missile ship thing. Uh, this episode states that the Cardassian Union uh, has the technology for quantum torpedoes, something Starfleet had only developed uh, by the early 2370s, basically first contact-ish era. The Enterprise E had them. That might have been... I forget if that's the first time that they were deployed uh, on screen. Could be wrong. Um, but around that time. Now, yes, it's possible the Cardassians stole the tech via the Obsidian Order, and they've proven to be capable of that uh, before, but understanding the controls of a runabout and stealing the schematics for Starfleet's most powerful shipboard weapon are two very different things, uh, especially for a regional power that only just came to prominence and whose intelligence agency was in shambles in the wake of the Romulan Cardassian attack on the Dominion. That's got to be one of the nerdiest sentences I've ever said in my entire life. Anywho, there's also the general, though noted, not universal, lack of character development across the board. Not everyone had this problem. Uh, certainly the Doctor, Seven of Nine, and to a certain extent, Kess had excellent character development over the run of the show. Because they had character development. Now I want to preface that, with some exceptions, and this is kind of dependent on the episode, there isn't really a main character in Voyager that I don't like. They're all pretty likable, and they all have a pretty good moment, uh, at least once in the series. Mostly, uh, they have several. Uh, there's very rarely an episode where Janeway isn't great. Um, or, you know, the, you know, char the characters aren't bad characters. Uh, I just want to make that known. However, most of the characters, except some of the, except the ones I just mentioned and some others, had character traits basically assigned to them for the plot of a particular episode. And they're hardly, if ever, referenced again. Chakotay's boxing abilities are a great example. But the biggest problem, uh, writing-wise, is the overall journey itself. It seems that Voyager, which is a ship that is trapped 70,000 light years from the nearest Federation space station, it's almost no damage incurred during the seven years that it's in the Delta Quadrant, loses 17 shuttlecraft, and returns with a crew who is, well, for one thing, mostly still staffed, generally happy, and in no real physical or mental trauma. Voyager needed a Lost in Space plot uh, to work as an exploration show in the time period that it's set in the Alpha Quadrant, um, because the Alpha Quadrant wouldn't work, uh, because, well, this. <laughs> um, but they didn't play up the Lost in Space element enough. Shows like Battlestar Galactica, Star Blazers 2199, uh, or even like the Zindi arc in Star Trek Enterprise show a much better approach to this type of aspect. Damage ad adds up because everything can't be fixed due to lack of resources. Not everyone's going to make it out alive either from battles uh, or from un unforeseen circumstances. 
And there's gonna be mental trauma from these fights. Um, that's how combat works. Um, yeah, so they didn't really take advantage of their lost in space narrative. Again, with a couple of exceptions, the episodes Year of Hell, Part 1 and 2, do a great job of showing this, like, mounting damage, mounting trauma, mounting losses. But that's at a pretty much entirely based around time manipulation and lots more fighting uh, on the part of Voyager. So it doesn't really count. But they, they did show that they could do it uh, and do it well. They just didn't do it for the most of the run of the show. Then we come to the elephant in the room, Borg space. And here's where the writers really screwed up. Because they didn't understand what makes the Borg scary. The Borg are seen, what, three or four times in The Next Generation? And none in DS9, apart from the first episode, which is a flashback to The Next Generation episode, but told from a different perspective. They have something like 20 plus appearances in Voyager. The Borg are scary because you don't see them that often. They're the really, really powerful, OP, faceless enemy that comes out of nowhere when you least expect it and blows everything up and steals all your people and turns them into mindless drones that can then steal more people. Uh, and yeah, I know, First Contact did, uh, introduced the Borg Queen, but Voyager established that she wasn't, in fact, in hive mind control of all the drones. And they never referenced the one thing that could be an explanation, Hugh, whose individuality almost destroyed the Borg. That never comes up in Voyager. So the Borg go from this really terrifying, almost zombie-esque, you can't kill them, uh, and the more you try, the more they adapt, and the more they get stronger against you, to basically being, you know, your your new villain of the week, alien, anti-Voyager, whatever. Borg space itself was written to be so huge, so, so the Borg could be a recurring villain, um for some reason. That would be like Thanos being the recurring villain in the MCU. And by recurring villain, I mean he shows up in every single movie as the actual villain, not as a teaser for uh, the next for the next film or the next phase. It wouldn't work because he's a threat that the Avengers only barely beat as the Borg are a threat that Starfleet only ever barely beats. They aren't a good recurring antagonist. Need proof? Species A472. They're the species that is kicking the Borg's collective asses uh, so much that the Borg must ally with Voyager. You know, the species that can't be negotiated with. This was done specifically to, to traverse Borg space quickly and painlessly. Uh, but if the writers wanted to get through Borg space easily, don't make Borg space so big. Or send Voyager a different way. And I know what you're going to say. The map shows Borg space is that big, so it must be written that way for continuity. The map didn't exist when they wrote the show. They could have written the Delta Quadrant to look however they wanted. It's entirely new territory, which is good. It makes for, for good creative uh, decisions, which actually kind of leads into another problem of Voyager constantly figuring out a way to loop back into the Alpha Quadrant powers all the time uh, or use the Borg, uh, things that we recognize, instead of creating their own uh, really good villain species, even though they had a few. They they did have a few. Uh, the Herogen and... Um, oh... There's a couple other ones that are that are pretty good. Not all of them. The Kazon are, meh. They're hit or miss. Um, th there are a few really good Voyager villain species, but they don't get enough time to shine because you're constantly somehow getting yourself involved with the Alpha Quadrant, like the Cardassian missile or the Romulans attacking the Prometheus, or you're screwing around with the Borg fighting the big three-legged plot devices. Uh, admittedly, though, there are some things... Uh, about this that I found interesting. Uh, but the idea as a whole is a result of lazy writing. I could say the same thing for Q, but I'm kind of okay with a more comic relief Q uh, than the kind of funny yet sinister uh, weird twisted wisdom version of Q that we get in Next Generation. Uh, and they do still teach Janeway lessons along the way. Um, and we also get to see more of the continuum, so I can be okay with how they handle Q. Um, not every new thing that Voyager did um, was poorly written. Again, I like the Q. The Herogen are cool villains. You know, there's a lot of cool villains. The, um, I can't remember the name. The, uh, Krenum, I think it was, that made the time ship. Um, I think, I think that was their name. 
uh, there, there's a few really cool villains uh, that get introduced. Uh, you know, there's there's cool concepts here. There's a lot of potential in Voyager. Um, I don't think it's what Steve uh, Shrives describes as basically seven seasons of first season Next Generation. Because first season Next Generation, at least to me, is almost unwatchable. Whereas I can sit down and watch several episodes of Voyager and be, you know, totally satisfied. Again, some of my favorite episodes of Star Trek are in Star Trek Voyager. Year of Hell is in... It's a great set of episodes from Star Trek Voyager. Uh, you know, there's 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 a good World War II one, I believe, with the Herogen as the villains, which is cool. Um, all the stuff with Seven of Nine is really cool. There's really cool stuff. Uh, uh, Neelix is a really cool uh, new arrival character. The Doctor is is always entertaining. Robert Picardo does a great job. Um, underrated actor. Uh, Kate Mulgrew does a great job as Janeway. Janeway's a really great, a really uh, interesting captain. She's kind of a, a mix between uh, Picard, on oh, TV show Picard, and Cisco. Voyager has a lot of great elements. It's just they can't bring them all together in a coherent way. Voyager is a great example of not being greater than the sum of its parts. So, is Voyager a bad show? No. I just listed off a bunch of great aspects of, uh, of Voyager. Again, the sentient hologram. Uh, reintegrating a board back to normal human society, etc. I, I, again, I just listed off a whole cricket score of great things I think Voyager did. But it had major writing problems. And I'm not entirely sure it's fair to say it was lazy writing. Um, maybe uninformed uh, writing in, in the terms of Star Trek lore. A show as lore-heavy as Star Trek needs a lot of attention put into making consistent uh, decisions in writing. Um, it's, it, it's hard to write for Star Trek. Uh, it's a delicate balance between too little, uh, references, uh, and lore and too much. Um, and there are definitely times where there's way too much. Enterprise has a lot of instances where they're referencing way too hard to previous Star Trek series. But yeah, it, it's not as bad as the, as the first season of the next generation. Like I said, that season is almost unwatchable. There's a couple of okay episodes. Um, the, the the best episodes by far are Encounter at Farpoint and the last episode. And the last episode is pretty bad until uh, you get to the point where the Romulans show up. Um, Voyager is still really enjoyable. But it isn't spectacular either. It's a Joe Average Star Trek show. It's a good Star Trek show. And it gets back to the heart of Star Trek of exploring, which um, DS9 had gotten away from in its Dominion War arc, which is a great arc, but it wasn't really what Star Trek was supposed to be. Voyager is back to that original ex uh, exploratory thing with a cool Lost in Space twist, but it just... It... <laughs> It doesn't come together coherently. However, I would make an argument that that actually makes it a great, um, or a, a, not a uh, great show, but a really watchable show. You can just pop an episode on for background noise, or just if you want to watch something that doesn't require you to have seen 15 episodes prior, which is frankly me in the evenings after eight solid hours of school and homework. Um, so it has... A lot of really cool things. And, you know, a lot of the things I'm describing about Voyager also describe the original Star Trek series uh, and, and parts of the next generation. It's not a new thing to Voyager. It's just when you're so used to the great storytelling of later next generation and DS9 uh, and, you know, sci other sci-fi shows like Battlestar Galactica, you expect more out of your sci-fi. Voyager is still a very enjoyable sci-fi series and it's very watchable. Uh, and approachable. Something that shows like DS9 aren't. Anyway, hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and let me know what you think of Star Trek Voyager in the comments, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.